we remember our baptisms in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake, forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have for this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Almighty God, gracious Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit upon your faithful people. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may be seated. The first lesson, Revelation 14, 6, and 7. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth to every nation and tribe and language and people. 
And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. This is the word of the Lord. We read Psalm 46 responsively. God is our refuge and strength. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth gives way. Though its waters roar and foam. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. The Lord of hosts is with us. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. Be still and know that I am God. The Lord of hosts is with us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The second lesson is Romans 3, 19 through 28. And with Pastor Blake's, uh, Blake's uh, uh, direction, we will read the last sentence together. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. The word of the Lord. Holy Gospel according to St. John, the eighth chapter. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth 
will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. This is the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. Did you know that Martin Luther, the man we commonly associate with the Reformation as Luther's of course, wasn't actually named Martin Luther from the moment of his birth. Martin was his first name. He was named after Martin of Tours, a saint, because he was born on his feast day. But Luther was not his surname. Luther's surname was actually Luder, which in high German is a pejorative word. So, why did Luder change his name to Luther? Well, Luther is derived from the Greek word Eleutheros, which actually appears in our gospel reading today. The sun will set you free. Eleutheros means to be a free man. So Martin Luther renamed himself using this Greek term, which was actually pretty common during his day, in order to indicate that he was free. But that begs the question, what was Luther free from? I mean, Luther was just like any other Saxon, right? He was subject to the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. And as far as economic freedom goes, he didn't really need it. He was well-to-do. He was raised in a good family. His mother had connections. Two of his uncles on his mother's side were actually, well, one was a theology professor, the other taught medicine. So they were well-to-do, and they actually probably helped him get his position at the University of Wittenberg as an Old Testament scholar. So Luther really didn't need political or economic freedom. And when Luther renamed himself, that isn't the kind of freedom he was talking about. The freedom Luther was talking about is the freedom that Jesus describes in our gospel reading from St. John's Gospel. This is what Jesus says. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. What word is this? What word is Jesus describing here? Well, in the letter of St. Paul to the Romans, St. Paul makes a twofold distinction. He makes a distinction between God's law, the commandments, thou shalt, thou shalt not, and a different word from God. Namely, that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. That's the word that sets you free. That you are declared righteous before God on account of Christ Jesus. But, what sort of freedom does that get us? What are we freed from? Does this mean that you're able to go out into society then and do whatever you want? Does it mean that you no longer have to answer to your boss, you no longer have to pay the bills, and so on? No. <laughs> Once again, I know, darn. <laughs> Once again, we find our answer in John chapter 8. This is what the Jews were wondering who heard Jesus. They respond, we are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? I mean, that, that's kind of our situation as well. We're not slaves. I mean, we chose where we were going this morning. No one forced us to come here. 
We're even able to vote for our elected officials. That's something Luther would have never dreamed of. And in some countries, that still isn't the case. You're able to go to this door and buy whatever you want with the money that you've earned. And you earned that money probably doing a job that you chose in some way. So you have a lot of freedom. And the Jews here appeal to their identity as sons of Abraham. Right? We are sons of Abraham. We have been slaves to no one. And why do they respond this way? Well, what are they remembering? They're remembering the promises of God given to Abraham that they would inherit the land of Canaan, that they would be more numerous than the stars, and that all nations would be blessed through them. They have the promises of God. How are they slaves? They're children of Abraham. But it's a bit ironic that they say this, because if you know anything about Israelite history, <laughs> then you know that for the majority of their existence, they were under the boot of somebody. Right? Let it be the Egyptians in the very beginning, we all know that, the story of the Exodus, or the Babylonians who sent Judah into exile, or later on after the Babylonians, the Syrians, the Seleucid Empire, who came in and subjected them to their rule. And once the Syrians were gone, who came in to rule over them? The Romans. And that's what they were experiencing during the time of Jesus. So their persistence that they are free seems a bit foolish. It seems a bit forgetful. But Jesus isn't even talking about slavery to empires here. He's talking about a different kind of slavery. A slavery that they were subject to as human beings, a slavery that we were subject to as human beings. And this is what Jesus says. Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. So what were we slaves to? We were slaves to sin. And remember, sin isn't merely some accidental feature. It isn't an action that you perform. Sin is much deeper than that. Jesus describes sin in the Gospel of Luke. He does this in Luke chapter 6. For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. So what is Jesus saying there? He's saying that sinners sin. The reason you sin is because you're a sinner. You aren't a sinner because you sin. That would be easy, right? That means that we just have to shape up our act, be more disciplined about the way we behave, and all of our problems are solved. They're done. But I'm sure many of us in this room have struggled with different sins. And we think we have a handle on it, but then guess what happens? It gets us. It comes back. And why is that? Because sin dwells within our flesh. St. Paul describes it this way, that on account of one man's trespass, the trespass of Adam, all were made sinners. We've inherited this condition from Adam. And this sin is actually a disposition within us. It's a state of rebellion. We don't trust in God above all things. Instead, we trust in created things, including ourselves, as opposed to God. We don't even have a knowledge of God's wrath. We would choose to ignore it. I'm fine. Let's just pretend the fact that God isn't a righteous 
judge. I'm a victim. I don't deserve what comes my way. And we also don't have a knowledge of God's law. Or a perfect knowledge of God's law. Right? We want to do our own will, not the will of God. Even the law of God, which is written upon our hearts, is imperfect because of sin. So we are blind. We don't know God naturally. We don't know his will. And we don't even desire to do his will. So that's what slavery to sin looks like. And it's true for all humanity. But we wouldn't know this apart from the law of God. That's also what St. Paul talks about. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. And that's why God gave his commandments. A commandment comes your way and it reveals your sin. Thou shalt not covet. And then we realize that we've been jealous of our neighbor and their belongings. Thou shalt not murder. And we might not have killed anybody, but we do harbor anger and on helpful thoughts towards the people who have wronged us. And we read the second commandment. Thou shalt not use the name of the Lord your God in vain. And then we realize, well, when was the last time I thanked God for his daily blessings and his riches? I tend to only go to God when the sky is falling around me. So the commandments reveal our sin. And that's actually why God gave the law. So that sin might increase. So that we would know that we are sinners in need of a Savior. But here's the good news. For you, Christ Jesus has set you free from sin. He has completely set you free from sin. And this is what he tells those listening to him in John chapter 8. The Son remains forever. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. How has Jesus set us free from sin? Well, God made him sin for us. He became a curse for us. He claimed your sin as his own. That's why he was baptized by John the Baptist. He received a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Did he need a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins? No, he had nothing to repent of as the Holy Son of God. But by receiving this baptism, he identified himself with you, with your sin, and with the sin of all humanity. That means that your sin, the sin you feel in your flesh still today, and the sin that you see with your eyes, the sin you see your hands commit and your mouth commit, that's no longer your sin. It belongs to Christ Jesus. He has taken it upon his shoulders once and for all. Jesus Christ became the greatest blasphemer, the greatest liar, the, um, the most ungrateful person for you when he carried the sins of the world upon his shoulder. Behold the Lamb of God who carries away the sin of the world. Behold the Lamb of God who carries away your sin. And since Christ Jesus has claimed your sin as his own, that means that your sins are no longer counted against you. Jesus has died to sin once for all. It's done. You are free. And this freedom from sin is given to you through the word of freedom, the proclamation of the gospel, the forgiveness of sins in Christ Jesus. God gave you this word in your baptism 
where you were baptized into Jesus' death, and with him you die to sin, and now with him you live to God. And he proclaims this forgiveness to you day in and day out. You encounter this forgiveness in the promises of the Old and the New Testament. In the promises of God that you've committed to memory. In the words of a brother or sister in Christ who proclaims the forgiveness of sins to you. And you receive this forgiveness today at the Lord's altar where he gives you the body and blood of his son to eat and to drink for the forgiveness of all your sins. Dear Christian, you are free. Sin is no longer your Lord. It is no longer your master. God is your Lord. He is the one who watches over you, who rules over you, and cares for you. And nothing can get in the way of you and God. He is for you. And you are innocent. You are righteous in his sight on account of Christ Jesus. That's what the Reformation is about. That's why Luther changed his name to Luther. So, you can consider yourselves Luthers. Free people. And, maybe we can give a different name to the title Lutheran Christian. The Freed Ones. Amen.
please rise. <coughs> we continue by confessing our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. We add to our prayers today Betsy and Peggy, who are both in the ICU. We pray for their healing. We also pray for people in Israel and Gaza. We pray that they are supported in their suffering and that God would deliver them. Mighty Fortress, Rock of Refuge, sustain your church. Deliver her from error and preserve the proclamation of your gospel. That it, would, that it would resound to every nation, tribe, people, and language, that all might give you glory, Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Mighty fortress, rock of refuge, bless all ministers of your word. Help them rightly to preach your law, so that all are held accountable to you without excuse. And joyfully proclaim your gospel, that all would know Jesus Christ as their Savior, Lord, in your mercy. Mighty fortress, rock of refuge, look with compassion on all who are blind to the bondage of their sin. Open their eyes by your word and grant them the freedom of sonship and a permanent place in your household. Lord, in your mercy. Mighty fortress, rock of refuge, make us truly your disciples. Keep us in your word. Free us from all errors and make our homes and families peaceful. Preserve all parents and encourage them in their godly task, that children will be brought up in the fear and instruction of the Lord. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Mighty fortress, rock of refuge, bless all civil authorities, especially our president, Congress, and all who make, administer, and judge our laws. Protect them from the temptations that beset their offices, and grant them wisdom and courage to serve with integrity. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Mighty fortress, rock of refuge, be, your, be near to all who cry to you for the deliverance of body and soul, especially Betsy and Peggy those who suffer in Israel and Gaza. Gilbert, Kathy, Pelasia, Pastor Just, Laureen, Becky, Carol and Heather, Marshall, the McGowan family, all victims of natural disasters, the victims of the wildfires in Maui, and all patients suffering from COVID-19. Grant them release from their afflictions according to your will. Sustain their hope in the full and final salvation that awaits them at the day of Christ's appearing. Lord, in your mercy. Mighty fortress, rock of refuge, bless all who come to the altar to partake of Christ's own body and blood for the forgiveness of their sins. Grant them repentant hearts 
that recognize their sin, and by your spirits grant them faith in the forgiveness of sins given to them in this sacrament. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. We exchange the peace of Christ with those around us. Guys, sister, it's nice to meet you. What is your name? Marsh. Well, we're happy to have you with us on the show. Peace, Steve. Peace, Robin. Peace be with you, sir. What is your name? Carl. Carl, it's nice to meet you. Peace with you, Carol. Peace be with you, Dusty. Peace Peace be with you, Joyce. Peace be with you, Diana. Peace be with you, Chris. Jim. Peace be with you, Christine. Peace be with you, Meg. Peace be with you, Eric. Peace be with you, Dow. Peace be with you, Levi. Peace be with you, Paul. Peace be with you, Shane. Peace be with you, Peace be with you, Peace be with you, that you have given us. Make our lives dedicated to you in response. Use us in these gifts to help those in need. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed good and right that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, 
through Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection has gained for us the way of everlasting life. And so, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn, Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth. In mercy for our fallen world, you gave your only Son, that all those who believe in him should not perish, but have eternal life. We give thanks to you for the salvation you have prepared for us through Christ Jesus. Send now your Holy Spirit into our hearts, that we may receive our Lord with a living faith as he comes to us in his holy supper. Amen. Amen. Come, Amen. Lord Jesus. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Lord, hear us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
body of Christ given for you. This is the true body of Christ given for you. This is the true body of Christ given for you. This is the true body of Christ given for you. Revive the church today Then in an age when darkness grip the earth The just shall live by faith was learned The Holy Spirit gave the church we miss the true body and blood of our Lord and Savior As Christ reformation Jesus, the one who made our life burned. everlasting, departs in peace. In later years a great revival came, when saints would seek the Lord and pray. Once again we need that holy flame To meet the challenge of today Come Holy Spirit Dark is the we need your filling, your love and your mighty power. Move now among us. Stir we this the true body and blood of our Lord and we Savior Christ Jesus in the one true faith. Life Come, Holy Spirit, revive the church today, 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 today. Welcome to the Lord's Table. This is the true body of Christ given for you. This is the true body of Christ given for you. This is the true body of Christ given for you. This is the true body of Christ given for you. This is the true body of Christ given for you. This is the true body of Christ given for you. May this, the true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Christ Jesus, keep you in the one true faith unto life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. <laughs> Joyce, this is the true body of Christ given for you.
Jesus is the true blood of Christ shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. Amen. body and blood of our Lord and Savior Christ Jesus. Keep us in the one true faith unto life everlasting. Depart in peace. We rise for the post-communion canticle. Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life, and we pray that in your mercy you would strengthen us through this gift, in faith toward you, and in fervent love toward one another, for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Receive the Lord's blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.
Thank you.